We're joined now by Kathy Reese from Fenimore Craig. Thank you so much for being with us, Kathy. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. For those who may not be familiar with your firm, can you give us a little bit of background? I'm glad to. Uh, Fenimore Craig is a law firm that is in the mountain region in the southwest states. And we uh, specialize in all sorts of different areas that deal with the southwest. Um, we have six offices, including in Reno and Las Vegas, and in Col uh, Denver, Colorado, Phoenix, Arizona, and other cities in, in Arizona. And that means that we, because of our location, do a lot of bankruptcies, as well as real estate issues, and mining issues, healthcare, just a variety of things that relate to the Southwest and the type of uh, demographics we have in that state. Someone brought this up earlier. Is the nature of Chapter 11's changing as opposed to what it was 10 years ago? I know that there's sh the ones that we see now, of course we saw you know, a big one with American Airlines, but Chapter 11's, are they a whole different ball game than they used to be when they, they used to be Chapter 11's companies would be in it for two years or so? And it seems like that's not the trend anymore. Well, it turns out that about 95% of our bankruptcy cases at this point are sales. So that um, high percentage of sales really does change the marketplace and it changes the use of this mechanism. But there are still a lot of cases that are still traditional restructures where you have a plan of reorganization, you have a lender where you're going to be doing cram down, and the, so that a lot of the traditional concepts are still there. The um, other interesting thing about it is that our bankruptcy judges are rolling out of their terms and so we have quite a turnover because of those retirements. And in some states, for example with Arizona, seven of our seven judges have been replaced in a two-year time period. And in Nevada, three of the four judges have been replaced in a two-year time period. That really has a great deal of influence and change um, upon the approach because there's this element of unknown um, diligence or unknown issues that we think the judge might respond to differently than the pri um, prior. Interesting. Judges. Let's talk about the U.S. economy for a moment and uh, distressed investments. The economy is recovering, and so that means uh, there aren't quite as many deals out there as there used to be, and a lot of companies are going after the same things. What do you see as far as opportunities that are out there right now? Well, if you, a lot of the people here at this conference are particularly talking about the fact that there aren't as many restructures to do, and that's probably true. There aren't as many restructures in the bankruptcy court, but that's because a lot of things are happening outside the bankruptcy court. One of the tools that people are using is just outright sales, finding the right buyer, putting the deals together. Another is the use of state court and federal court receivers, so it's a different venue than the bankruptcies. Uh, another mechanism is to just have the lender foreclose and then be able to turn around and receive sell uh, or do a UCC Article 9 sale because then that means the lender's in control and is able to either take the asset, do what they want to do in terms of restructuring it and positioning it for value so that the lender uh, is able to do more. Now one of the big differences from the prior years is there's quite an active market in distressed debt um, and distressed assets and with buyers and sellers in those industries. Um, it, previously, the, you had the original lender and the lender would stay in the whole time. But now with distressed debt wanting to be purchased and sold and distressed assets wanting to be purchased and sold, it really changes the dynamics, changes the time frames and the venue of where it's going to take place. So when we look towards the future for the next year, year and a half, uh, distressed investing, do you see any more opportunities coming down the road? Do you think it's going to be kind of stagnant for the foreseeable future? I think there are quite a few opportunities that are still there. In the restructuring area, many of the people at the conference are talking about limited opportunities. But in the distressed debt area and the distressed asset area, you have an awful lot of money ch chasing the same deals. And as they're chasing those deals, um, they become more uh, competitive for the seller. And so over the last year, there have been a lot of seller um, situations. Um, I've represented in the Mortgages Limited bankruptcy uh, the hard money lender's successor that is actually selling off the assets and in the last five years we've been able to sell 55 of our properties. In the last year we've sold 20 of those properties. So there have been a lot of assets available on the market for those people who want to buy. Now in the buying area if you want to buy debt there are lenders who are who themselves are tired or they need to move that credit on and use that money and reinvest it someplace else so they'll sell at a discount. But in addition, you also have 
the um, parties that really are out there looking to find a way to get into a company or to get onto a piece of property that they really like, and they're looking for the mechanism of how they're going to do it, whether it's going to be because they're buying the distressed debt or the distressed asset. And that is a very common uh, place to find activity, it, particularly in certain areas. Um, in um, condo projects and in um, healthcare, raw land, uh, hospitals um, in the healthcare vicinity. I mean, we've had six hospitals that have gone into bankruptcy just in the last eight months in Arizona. And so it's an area where there will be quite a few opportunities. And another area of opportunity, and um, Deidre mentioned it this morning, and it's been my personal experience, that there are still a number of Ponzi schemes and um, affinity fraud matters that are arising. In the Southwest, you oftentimes have elderly people who have been taken advantage of and who are being put into in, um, investments that they have no business being in. And there's a certain element of fraud that uh, takes place when you feel comfortable with somebody because they're in your church or they're in your synagogue. And that affinity fraud um, has had a quite a, an increase over the years. And it's a very active market in Arizona, Utah, Nevada, California, Texas, for the elderly um, that are in these cases. I've had probably four affinity fraud type cases. And out of those fraud cases, once either it's the SEC or the State uh, Department of Financial Institutions or a bankruptcy trustee who is put in, they can start gathering the assets up. And in two of these large cases that I've had, a lot of the assets was, were um, real estate properties. And so they were able to then sell those properties in order to gather as much money as possible in order to pay back the investors that are elderly and need their money. We've had some interesting results. Um, not only were we able to uh, in the mortgage is limited case, sell probably 55 of the properties with the five or six that are left. But we also were able to take advantage of the theft loss, which was an unusual thing. Um, for the investors, we were able to go in and get a theft loss approved by the Internal Revenue Service, similar to the Bernie Madoff case. But in our situation, the principal had committed suicide, so there wasn't anyone left to indict. And, but the theft loss was important to the investors who still had ordinary income and they needed something to be able to offset against that. And so that theft loss was an important value that we added mm -hmm. through the distressed market and through the distressed assets. A lot of good information, a lot of good insight. Kathy, thank you so much for being with us today. You're we welcome. We appreciate your time. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you.